Happy Monday. Good morning. Good morning, James. I am uh, really excited to have you here, um, Andy. Thanks for being here. Um, let's kick off. Can you, can you tell the audience uh, a little bit about yourself so, so we can just uh, get an introduction about what's going on today? Yeah, sure. And uh, James, I've been uh, actually waiting a long time to have this kind of a conversation because uh, whenever we get together, um, every, the ideas just flow. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Andy Kaufman. Uh, my background is that uh, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of experience um, in the healthcare systems of, of various uh, uh, types and, and uh, levels. And, um, you know, I've had, through that experience, I've come to see uh, some of the truth about the healthcare system and that it's uh, not what it seems at all. Um, and of course, that's uh, really affected me personally and how I uh, uh, carried out my career. I've made some big changes over the years and, and I'm still evolving there. Um, and so what I want to, I want to talk about that, of course, and, uh, also, you know, want you to know that, um, even though I've uh, had a lot of these ideas and studied a lot of this material, done a lot of this research over the years, this is, uh, actually the first time I'm coming out in public, uh, as a physician, um, uh, really telling the truth, uh, about what's going on. I, I've definitely been, you know, critical of antidepressants before, um, but in a very uh, academic way, something you know that would be tolerated at a conference. Um, but uh, today, I'm going to actually talk about the real truth, um, and so uh, it's going to be a bit different. Um, so, just to give you my credentials, so you see where I'm coming from—that I'm I'm not a crackpot or anything like that. Uh, so, I went to medical school in the Medical University of South Carolina. I did my uh, psychiatry residency at Duke University. Um, met some very interesting people there and uh, had a lot of interesting observations. Then I came up to um, upstate New York to uh, the State University of New York to do my fellowship in forensic psychiatry. And after that, I stayed on as a faculty member. Uh, first, I was the assistant fellowship director, and so I had a teaching role. I was also in charge of uh, research for our division, uh, so I have some research experience and some publications. Uh, then I, I went on to uh, join the uh, administration of the department as the uh, medical director of faculty practice, which was sort of uh, um, helping manage uh, from a business point of view. Um, I had also had uh, some experiences in on. I started a medical device company. It was actually a suicide monitoring device system, which uh, had a patent granted. And um, there may be still some uh, business opportunities there, but it's uh, very tough to uh, start a technology company in the United States. Um, and uh, then after uh, all that experience, I went off uh, uh, to do my own private consulting. And so I work with uh, a residential uh, facility for uh, teenagers and do clinical work there. Uh, essentially these days, mostly um, I'm taking kids off of uh, psychiatric medications and um, trying to inspire them, uh, supervise their psychotherapy, uh, work on nutritional interventions with them, uh, basically anything I, I can do with them. Uh, I teach them meditation, uh, things like that. Um, I also have, uh, I do some natural healing uh, consultations, which is a, a very new thing for me, but I've spent the last uh, year and a half studying uh, natural medicine, uh, natural healing. And then I've also have uh, developed uh, um, consulting as an expert witness. So I uh, do a lot of uh, work related to employment um, in the workers' compensation system, which I uh, also have a unique understanding of uh, from this experience. Um, I work uh, for a lot of other employers uh, related uh, incidents with, you know, is the person having a, a mental problem interfering with their ability to do their job? Um, I uh, do expert witness work for various types of lawsuits um, and with psychiatric issues. Um, and including malpractice, and uh, I've done a lot of uh, work in the criminal justice system as well, um, like testified at a murder trial, I testified, you know, in federal, state, local courts, uh, et cetera, like that. So, so that gives me a, a unique systems uh, perspective to see how, you know, health, mental health issue interacts with uh, criminal justice system and other, uh, you know, employment insurance, uh, et cetera. So, so I do have a, a bit of a unique perspective um, to look at all of these uh, issues. Uh, under. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm blessed to have you. I, I know, I know my audience is too. So, so th thank <laughs> you for, for, for being here and, and for uh, being brave right now, because 
um, from the outside, I have seen just how difficult it is for anyone in the professional industry, whether it be working at a hospital to even working in, in uh, you know, clinical or bureaucratic work, that there's just certain things you're not allowed to say, certain things that you're not allowed to talk about. But when I say not allowed to talk about, um, I'm talking about mind control. I'm talking about the chemical uh, pressures that happen. Um, I, I, I have a really good friend of mine that, that works in a hospital. And um, he makes it very clear that the word vaccine injury is something that crazy people say. And, and he has created an atmosphere with his employees where that is a joke. That is a running joke that they, that they claim that people say. And he ends up turning yeah. a lot of parents into uh, really evil enemies is what he calls them because they may be, uh, say, homeschooling or they may be utilizing some form of, of medicine that is not sanctioned by them. And so it ends up creating a, a, a very strong peer pressure from the top down where you have someone who's in charge, who's telling all their staff, yeah. no, that parent is, is incompetent. We should, in fact, think about calling CPS on them uh, because they're not listening to, to yeah. what we want them to do. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, uh, from a psychological perspective, actually, you could see this as a, as a type of defense mechanism. Um, you know, I think uh, cognitive dissonance is also a very good way of looking at this. Uh, and this is the thing that really keeps physicians from seeing, you know, the truth right before their eyes. I mean, every physician, if you pin them down, they, they'll know, they'll be able to tell you that their patients don't get better. Uh, they can't tell you about anybody's illness that they cured. You know, they know that people are getting sick. Uh, they're not looking to that, you know, they're not monitoring themselves as being the cause because they, you know, that would be too risky. Um, but, you know, they're put in this position like, uh, um, you know, there's this sort of hazing brainwashing process that all doctors go through and other healthcare personnel go through it to some degree and they're kept ignorant about certain things to some degree as well. But, you know, I can speak about being a doctor. So, you know, they first they work you to the bone, um, you know, just crazy hours. Uh, you have to study, learn massive amount, memorize massive amounts of material that's totally irrelevant to healing people. Um, but you do this as a ritual and then you, you know, you take an exam that's, uh, you know, two, eight hour days. Imagine taking a 16 hour exam. <laughs> and if you fail it, you basically, you can't continue. Like you can't go to the next step. You can't become a doctor. Right. And so there's this kind of uh, emotional experience and, uh, putting just every waking hour, you know, into studying and learning. And then when you do your residency, um, we finally you graduated, you're a doctor right now, you're an apprentice basically. And it could be up to 10 or more years, depending on the specialty during that time, they pay you really low wages. You have these big loans from the debt, from uh, the tuition most people have, and I'm talking two, three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't pay that back. So that debt's building up and then you're, you're living on, you know, subsistence wages. You're working really long hours. Uh, you know that, you know, being a doctor means that you're going to, you know, have uh, wealth and resources at your disposal, right? But it's this delayed gratification. And so, so while a person is under all that stress, working those long hours, you know, being deprived of material wealth, um, that's an opportunity to, you know, basically tell them whatever you want them to do. Um, and, and that's pretty much what's done. And when you're working so much, you don't have time to think about it. You don't have time to sit and research and look at the big picture. You just kind of have to learn what's put in front of you and just do it. Absolutely. And then when you get out, finally at the end, you're like, all right, you run out, you buy a house, you buy a car, you get married, you know, uh, you buy furniture, right? And then immediately you're in debt. Now more debt. So you, you've got to keep going to keep that going, to keep up that lifestyle that you've been dreaming about for 10 years or longer. And if you question things, then you realize, oh my God, well, I can't do this, right? If I can't do this, then I can't make the money. So then I'm just going to have to go bankrupt and, you know, be destitute. And, uh, that, that's far too, uh, dangerous to face for, for people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm extremely lucky actually that I've found this little niche where I can still practice as a conventional physician and you know do mostly the right thing and but it's still not perfect and I, I don't think i can sustain it indefinitely but uh but you know that's rare yeah and and if i i do risk uh you know like if i if i 
just try to practice the real deal and get people well, then I risk uh, all kinds of scrutiny, losing my license, all kinds of things. Right. And there's even a, uh, a precursor mind control. Well, what I mean by that is, is before you even um, think about doubting something, there is a pressure that comes with that. There's, there's a, uh, I don't even think it's conscious. I think it's a, a subconscious thing that's happening because you you have receptors that are open to you being an expert, to you being the person that, that literally is placed on a pedestal. If you look at the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Absolutely. And, and when you're placed on that pedestal, it, it creates an immense amount of pressure. When I say pressure, though, it's it's there's a subtlety here because there's a there's a pressure from shame, which most of us think about, but there's also a pressure from fame. There's a pressure from being the one that is the expert to where you feel absolutely obligated to give some sort of answer, some kind of of answer, it, just anything at all, even if you were compartmentalized. And this is something I wanted to get your take on because in the military, one thing that I noticed right away is that compartmentalization breeds ignorance, which breeds trust. You really, you really don't have any other choice. If you're on a submarine, you, you absolutely have to trust that the people in the engine room know what they're doing and that only you, you only know your radar portion. This is all you know is what's happening in the radar. So you end up with uh, a thousand blind mice that are trying to work together that can see really well what's right in front of them but there's really only just a very, very small handful of people right. that see so, the overall picture. Absolutely. So James, I, I think you, you well know that this is the pyramidal, you know, hierarchical structure of where there's compartmentalization and, uh, you know, uh, no, no shared knowledge from the top down. And so this is rampant. I mean, the whole paradigm of the modern allopathic medicine is about this way, right? The body is divided into all, you know, these arbitrary systems and you go to a doctor who specializes only in that system. Mm -hmm. So they have no understanding of how that relates to the whole body, the whole person. And, uh, and this fragmented care, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because the cause, the cause of the illness, right? So you have a stroke, you go to a neurologist, right? Or a neurosurgeon, you have a heart attack, you go to a cardiologist, you have peripheral vascular disease, you go to a, a vascular surgeon, right? Three different specialties. It's the same exact disease. Right. So how do you, you know, the same exact disease, just in a different, it's like if you had a bruise on your toe, you go to a, a podiatrist. podiatrist, And if you had a, a bruise on your finger, you go to a hand surgeon, you know, it's ridiculous. It's a bruise. So, but this, uh, you know, this, it totally obfuscates the underlying cause of the disease. So it's never addressed. It allows the system to uh, perform some kind of symptom relieving procedure that's very lucrative and it doesn't solve the problem. So it guarantees that you, you'll get to do that probably again, or maybe you'll get to send them to the person for the other part of their body later on, and then they'll get uh, to make some money off of them. Right, but it'll never actually address the underlying problem because it can't. The system can't see the underlying problem. Yeah, in fact, it seems like anyone by design. It seems like anyone who's trying to tie all these pieces together and to look at at, at someone's health as a as an entire system is usually the one that's mocked or ridiculed and, and, and explained. <laughs> you know, you don't know what the hell you're talking about if you're talking. Even the word holistic has a very very black cloud that's surrounded. Right. But if you just look at the actual definition of the word itself, it's, it's definitely shows you that there's a lot of, of, of pressure that's there that that's, I personally think most of us are blind to, especially the doctors. I, I don't think that they fully understand just how much chemical pressure comes with, with all this Kabbalah. Um, well, well, I can, I can give you an example of that, James, actually, uh, because you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry, right? I think most of your uh, viewership is uh, quite critical of that industry. And so they've had this, uh, you know, crazy marketing uh, strategy, you know, where they uh, basically hire uh, attractive women uh, or, or fun guys too. Uh, you know, they go into doctor's offices and hospitals. And, and you know, I, I was uh, in my, um, uh, sort of, I was practicing medicine in the time when it was the heyday of this, when you know, they, when it was like, you know, really lavish dinners at the five-star restaurant, or they would take people, you know, fly them to, uh, you know, Caribbean Island or to a sports game. I mean, I, I never, uh, you know, because I was in training or I was a low-level person, so I was never eligible for that. But I, I did go to some of those fancy dinners and such. 
And, you know, like at first I was just seduced by it. I was ignorant and uh, I enjoyed it, but, but I, I, I fairly quickly became aware of, you know, well, what are they getting for this? You know, they must be getting something. <laughs> and it's not, you know, they're not like actually teaching you, uh, you know, the truth about their medicine because it's advertising and that, that's not the truth. So, um, so I began to look at this and I, I stopped, uh, you know, accepting things myself. But, but I saw there was this great study where there was like surveys of doctors. Um, you know, do you think that your relationship or accepting gifts from the drug reps influences your prescribing practice, right? And they, of course, they all say no. <laughs> but you know, the drug companies are spending a lot of money on this. They, they wouldn't do it. It wouldn't make business sense unless it was changing their prescribing habits. And of course, they have data on that. And later on, I found out they're actually monitoring every, every doctor that they're talking to to see where their prescriptions go. And if they're giving you stuff and your prescriptions are not in their direction, they're, they're calling you up and letting you know about it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so, right. so, but, but that, you know, just shows that, that of course the doctors are totally, you know, at least they, they don't want to admit that they're aware to it. Even, even if it comes into their awareness, they just suppress it, yeah. uh, you know, as quickly as possible because it doesn't fit that expert uh, identity uh, paradigm, you know, as a, uh, and, and there's a benevolence to that, you know, self image too, right? It's not just about, uh, you know, egoic gain. Um, you know, people feel like, oh, I'm doing a good service and, you know, and of course that makes me powerful and, uh, prestigious and all that stuff. Cool. And, and, and also thought of a term that you might like to describe, you know, that, that power differential between uh, patient and doctor, you know, where, and, and it's, you know, it's even more than you say, because there is that obedience, right. As a patient, even, even myself, when I've been a patient, even, even after I was a, a licensed physician myself, going to the doctor, I felt like obedient, like I should be obedient to this person. I should do what they say or else I better have a good reason why not to, you know, almost like I'm a child trying to convince the parent not to have to do some responsibility, right. you know? So, so could this, could we call this like the spell of the white coat? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you nailed it. I, I, and it works on both sides. It, mm -hmm. By you putting that costume on, um, you are losing a lot of abilities, um, abilities that require you to be vulnerable so that you can learn from the patient. But how can you learn when you're the one on the pedestal who's supposed to be the expert? Again, guys, this is not, I, this is not at all a bunch of doctors that are just super arrogant. That are, this is not, no, these are caring, kind individuals that are simply placed in a position that anyone was going to react the same way. If someone's coming to you looking for help and they need help and you are considered the expert among society, you are going to give an answer regardless of what that is. Most of the time that answer is probably gonna be something that you've regurgitated. And the regurgitation is gonna be something that's gonna happen after years and years of conditioning. Well, that, that's exactly what medical school makes you do. Yeah. It makes you regurgitate things. And, if you, and you can't say, I don't know. Like, you know, you're, you're like a, on your surgical rotation, right? And, you know, you're, you basically have to stand there and hold a retractor unless the surgeon or the resident, you know, like you impress them or some way and they invite you to do something interesting, you know? And so it's, it's like standing there holding the door open all day, you know, for hours, sometimes like six, eight hours. Right. And, uh, and then they're going to ask you, you know, they call it pimping. They're going to pimp you. They're going to ask you some question, right? And if, if you don't know it, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get your turn to, you know, put a suture or hold something important or, right. you know. Right. So it really does turn into a, uh, a, a Kabbalistic kind of um, initiation. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, is that um, when you're given something so complex, I, I've noticed that the naming is quite the ritual that you're taught what the names are for all the different parts in the body. And I think that there's an overspell <laughs> that comes with that because if you can name something, you are now under the impression that you understand that. Oh, yes. And that everyone else understands that too. And that's why it's so easy to dismiss a, a patient who might say, well, I know this sounds crazy, but, but I want to tell you about my knee. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is about your shoulder and it, you know, no. And it, it's, it, and to be fair, 
I, I work with people all the time. I'm not implying that people are like the perfect communicators and no one's there trying to waste anyone's time. But this is the art of medicine. This is what makes it the art. Yeah, yeah. You are having to interject with someone that you believe you're bequeathing with informed consent. I mean, th that is part of the of the oath, right? Is there's a, a thing called informed well, consent. It, you know, in, informed consent is obviously no longer taken seriously. Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, no, that that's something that I've actually studied quite carefully uh, uh, because, you know, and I, I've given some talks about that. And uh, no, it's, 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 it's really a joke in day-to-day -day practice. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, armchair discussion about it, uh, but that's about it. Uh, I, uh, I asked a doctor once, um, I used the word triune brain and it, it, well, I wasn't trying to be fancy. I, I, I looked up the term because I knew I was going to have some time with him. I was trying to research some, some, anyway, I, I used the word triune brain and, and the whole conversation had to stop because I used the word triune brain and he had to, he had to laugh at that for a while. And then I had to, I was like, well, wait a minute, let's find out why is that, why is that funny exactly? And I really couldn't get an example. I, I couldn't get him to explain why that was funny. The best I could get was he eventually said, well, people don't call it that. So the entire conversation. Well, I, I've never heard that term actually, James. What, what, does it re, what does it refer to? So the trying brain is literally just, just the parts. I'm going to, the limbic, I didn't want to use reptilian brain with him because I was afraid I was going to. Oh, the limbic it. system. Yeah. It's, yeah. If you would have said that, that would have uh, probably been different. Right. But, response. But, and, and, and this wasn't me trying to get him on a word. It's, I went to Wikipedia and I was like, I, no, it's, it's this part, the medulla, the, this, I just naming, all, if you add up all the central parts of the brain, which I'm not going to be able to name right now. <laughs> if you look it up, the name of that system is called the triune brain. Oh, I see. Okay. And, and so, you know, I was trying to, to get a very specific question. I, I spent hours just trying to get this question out to him because I knew I was going to have a limited window. But it wasn't going to work because I used the wrong term. Right. And so the, it then became okay to dismiss. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I believe that there is another sort of a psychological spell called Dunning-Kruger. Um, I, 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 I've seen this used as a, uh, a defense to dismiss anyone that is not a licensed doctor. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Do, do, you, do you see that too? Or, or what's your opinion? Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of this, right? I mean, uh, I think um, it, it's a lot of it is to protect your business interest, right? You, you have to protect against competition, right? It's like this came up when psychologists uh, were trying to prescribe in various states. And I think there's a couple of states where they're allowed to, right? So there was a, you know, big uh, pouring out because, you know, it's like we're the only ones qualified to do this work. And, you know, that's what the government says as well. Right. And, and, you know, back to what, what you were saying before about just being unable to recognize certain things or, you know, because of the spell, just sloughing it off is unimportant. Um, like I, I have experiences personally like that, like uh, when the, the gluten sensitivity issues started coming out in the media, right. Uh, in the early two thousands, I think uh, I was, you know, just laughing it off. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, this is silly nonsense. You know, this, these people, it's just a trend or whatever. Uh, and, but I did, I dismissed it without looking into it at all. Um, you know, of course. And I think uh, that's pretty much what most uh, doctors did as well. And even now, I, I don't think too many of them take it very seriously. Like it, it'd be more like, you know, the patient has a strange complaint and uh, you know, it doesn't fit any conventional uh, categories and it didn't respond to the first few drugs. So they just say, Oh, try, try going gluten free, you know, <laughs> and they figure, Oh yeah, that'll sound good to the person, but it's like a hail Mary, you know, that that's what it's rele relegated to in, uh, in medicine. But, but I've seen now personally examples of several patients that, you know, had real problems that just disappeared when they stopped eating gluten. And there's a whole other technology. I don't want us to get lost in this, but, but I, I can't stress this enough. There's an, a whole other technology here that we're calling the placebo effect, which, which I think is actually uh, destroying the power that's underneath that word. It sounds like such a weak word, but I mean, it's, companies are spending millions and millions of dollars first to mask the placebo effect just so they can figure out if, if a drug they've come up with is going to do something. 
And then after they mask it, then they're going to put the placebo back into it so that it can be accepted and sold and be more effective. Um, it, j just to catch people up, like the, a white powdered pill is, is not nearly, this is clinically true. A white powdered pill yeah. is not as effective as, as a glossy pill. A uh, well, a capsule is more effective than a, uh, a tablet as well. Yeah. And if it has a letter on it, that letter makes it more powerful. If Absolutely. it's twice a day, that's more powerful. If you're injecting someone with a needle, that's even more powerful. Even if it's saline, even if it's, it's right. it in, doesn't matter. Listen, in China, they actually inject antidepressants into people that they put in the hospital for depression because of that very reason. Explain that. What do you mean? It, well, like antidepressants, you know, uh, they're all pills. Right. In China, when if someone gets put in the hospital, like in a mental hospital, they actually give it by injection. I see. Instead I see. of the pill, like they have yeah. to create a special formulation of it <laughs> yeah. for that so purpose. If, I got you. So if anyone isn't following, what, what we're saying is, is that, is that so much of, of medicine today, this isn't a myth, this isn't a rumor, so much of medicine today when it comes to prescriptions and drugs is placebo based. Um, they actually have to peel that away and then add it back in. It makes it more effective. Even the gloss coating on the box your pills come in it has an effect, a measurable clinical effect. The size of the clipboard that someone wears when they give you a pill actually changes this. The fact that it's male or a female, typically older doctors, older male doctors in their 50s wearing a white lab coat carrying a, a heavy clipboard have more uh, placebo effect in them than a 20-year-old girl in a miniskirt with no clipboard who says, here, why don't you try this, this leaf? So right. there's a giant spectrum of purely just placebo effect and how that works. And it feels like I, I, it shocks me that we don't talk more about that or the well, doctors don't talk more. about. Right. That. Well, so, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you look in the right places, you can actually uh, find some interesting stuff. Like, for example, I used to work with a psychologist and uh, I, I'm blanking out his name. I want to say Gold, Goldberg, but I, I, I don't think that's it. But he actually wrote a book about this with respect to antidepressants because there's a ton of uh, evidence that really shows that antidepressants are uh, what you might call active placebos. So in other words, like aside from those superficial features that you were mentioning that do have a measurable response, um, antidepressants, you can actually, uh, they have an effect on your peripheral nervous system and gastrointestinal system. So like, in other words, it makes your, uh, it increases peristalsis when you take them. So you, you can feel your gut moving around. Uh, right. So you know that you have that what you've taken is physiologically active because you feel some re response in your body. Right. That, that's, and that clues you in. So, so when they've unblinded uh, trials, clinical trials, you know, where they're, they don't tell you if you're getting a placebo or the drug, they don't tell the doctor who gives it to you, it's, they call it double blind. Well, at the end, they would then ask the participants, do you think you got placebo or a drug? And they would be right over 90% of the time. Wow. Because they could tell the physiologic effect. And so when, um, uh, so there were other studies where they looked at the older antidepressants, so they're called tricyclic antidepressants. And those, their side effects are what they call anticholinergic, which means it suppresses your parasympathetic system. So it causes like constipation and mouth dryness, basically. Um, and what they did is then they gave, uh, instead of a placebo sugar pill, they gave atropine, which atropine is anticholinergic. You know, it's from the belladonna plant. And uh, so it has the same effects, but it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So it can't get into the brain. So it can't work as an antidepressant. And then they, so they basically, it was like a side effect matched placebo. And so whether you got the placebo or the drug, you still got a dry mouth and constipation. Wow. And then they found that basically the difference between the treatment group and the placebo shrunk to basically an insignificant level. Wow. So, so antidepressants really are placebos, just like you're talking about. But the thing is that the way our medical system uses placebos is at the expense of the patient, because we tell them that we're giving them a real cure, mm -hmm. right? And then what we're, we're not giving them the cure. We, we, we could possibly, they could possibly cure it through the placebo effect, but we're not making that possible, really. 
Um, you know, so we're, we're basically giving them enough placebo to keep them coming back for more, right? So make them a, a recurring customer. And that, that's really the business model of the healthcare people of the healthcare system to keep people sick. So they keep coming for more care and, you know, they keep taking drugs for, for their whole entire life, you know, more and more as they get older, uh, you know, that's that, and more and more visits and more and more procedures, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that, that's kind of, uh, uh, the paradigm of where things would be going, but, but what the placebo effect actually is, right. Is our, you know, power and it's, it's a little bit intangible. Uh, you know, exactly where it comes from, what it is. But, you know, like, uh, so you, maybe you say, you know, it's from spirit. Maybe you say it's from the divine or, you know, or you just say that it's built into our physiology, you know, that it's, uh, I mean, you could even understand this from a materialist perspective if you wanted to, <laughs> yeah. right? Because it's so demonstrable in so many different studies, right? So why not try to optimize it either as a primary treatment or as an, or as an adjuvant to combine with, you know, some somatic modalities, you know? Yeah. Uh, that that could really harness the power of it, and I think I think many alternative fields, like I think a lot of energy healing, is really, uh, I mean, maybe the energy is actually the power of the placebo, you know, the essence of it, right. um, and 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 they're you know very successful for a lot of things. Um, I, I have to I have to 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 plug my own book here because I, I wrote a book called The Technology of Belief. And what you're talking about is exactly, I think, in line with this, because there is a literal technology that's involved in our thought processes in where we put our focus, where I've been using the word prana just because I need a word to, to describe this uh, essence of belief, like a, almost like a plasma, an invisible plasma <laughs> that, you can, that you can place into different things. Uh, a mother can place... Uh, belief into a lunch that she makes for her child and right. that child can take that lunch to school and he recognizes that lunch it's glowing differently than everything else it has yeah. a different taste and flavor james and i did this this morning <laughs> i packed my love into two lunch boxes this yeah. morning <laughs> I, I i have had issues with my dog where i've been experimenting with this and uh, I, I'm not trying to tell everybody this is all it takes. This is how it works. I'm just telling you my experience. My dog went through a couple rounds of antibiotics for a skin condition. And uh, it just nothing is working. I finally have started to utilize the technology of belief. I'm, I'm literally mixing uh, brewer's yeast into his, into his wet dog food. But it's a ceremonial. I, I know it sounds silly. <laughs> I'm, I'm actively ceremonially like saying this is medicine this is good for you this is going to help your skin this is going to help that and that seems to have had much more effect than the than the antibiotics did yeah which i will say for years and years ago used to work fine on him and, and that's why it, it's there's just it's such a fascinating topic this technology of belief and it's something that's been suppressed in the medical community whether or not you want to say that that's like uh um, a, a thing they're doing on purpose or not. If you go back to the twenties, we literally created a war on plant medicine. We created a war on any kind of medicine at all. That wasn't part of this, uh, system of this pyramid system. And, and really when you do that, you're cutting off the technology of belief as it connects to herbs, because on the box itself, it's required by law to say, this is not a medicine. And if we understand how the placebo works, that the, if the gloss of the box makes the medicine work better, then certainly a giant label from the government that says this is not medicine would make something work worse. Absolutely. And, you know, this serves, uh, this serves uh, several purposes, you know, uh, but the two main, main purposes are, you know, one is, is uh, purely for profit. And you know, right, that uh, I... I I can't remember the name of the report that came out that was, uh, you know, ordered by Rockefeller that sort of started this change all over that you're, that you're referring to in the healthcare system. But the idea was to use petroleum and petroleum products uh, as the medicine, right? So that all the profit could be retained, uh, you know, by those companies and ownership. So um, with plants, obviously, anybody can grow a plant. You can't uh, make too much money off of selling it. You know, I mean, you can certainly, but you sell lettuce and vegetables, right? But there's a limited uh, profit, nowhere near what you can get for a pharmaceutical. So, you know, they figured out this thing. Well, so take the plant and then purify something out of it and then make it synthetically. And of course, it's not going to work as well. 
but then they can make the profit on it. So, so the only medicines related to plants are like that. And, you know, like one drug I could think of uh, like that, which is disaster, is called Taxol from the uh, Pacific yew tree, and it's a chemotherapy drug for breast cancer. Mm. Um, and it's uh, extremely, extremely expensive. Whereas, you know, if you just took the bark off the tree, uh, you know, maybe $10, 20 <laughs> you know, treatment for a month yeah. kind of thing, right? Yep. Um, so there's that, but then there's also now you're, the plants actually are the medicine. Uh, I mean, and it's, and, and I want to just say that, you know, there's not just one, uh, way to heal from a disease. Um, so there, and there's not even just one plant that will heal you from a certain condition. And in fact, it's quite interesting because if you go to different ecosystems in different climates throughout the world, you'll see that there are sets of healing plants that, work with that region's illnesses and uh you know they can work uh with people from other parts of the world too but it's like but they're different plants so you could find different plants from different regions that have similar curing effects uh it's quite interesting but if you take the actual medicines away from the people um especially when the medicines are readily accessible or put a couple of seeds in your backyard and you have medicine right. you know in a, in a month later well then the people can't get healthy themselves. They can't get well themselves. And you, you then can be in control. So if you want them to get well, you can provide them the medicines and the cures. If you don't, you don't. And you can keep them ill, right? Which is, which is where we're at now. Um, you know, our healthcare system keeps people ill. It doesn't, it doesn't cure illnesses. It doesn't cure disease. It doesn't restore people to full health. It does reduce some symptoms, it creates illnesses that aren't actual illnesses that are just a risk for an actual illness and then makes them into an illness that gets treatment. And so you're not really doing anything there um, except, uh, you know, whatever side effects you're getting uh, from those medicines. Um, and, but, uh, but, the, but the healthcare, so, so basically people stay sick so that they can't, you know, rise up in any way that they want. Uh, they're under control. They're they're more vulnerable, and then they're extremely dependent. Um, so there's this ongoing ongoing revenue. Well, I would also say that um, <clears throat> you lose a lot of people that are looking for the truth on this subject because they're under the impression that what you and I are saying is is that people have to be evil for this to happen. <laughs> and, and I, I want to clarify that because you, you yeah. don't have to be, you can be a really good, great person. You can have a Boy Scout troop. You can sponsor the PTA. You can, you can help people in your community. It, it's, this isn't about, uh, we're not even suggesting that doctors are evil, but I, I it, just to explain what I mean, uh, in the Navy, everyone is put on a ship and you were sent out or on a submarine, you were sent out. You are now out there in the water. You feel completely autonomous. You feel completely in charge of everything around you. In fact, the captain is literally responsible for everyone's life on there. He's given an order, and um, that order is something that he has to agree to do. He becomes the bequeather of that. It's a little, little bit different kind of setup. I'm telling you guys this because every single person on that boat can be the most patriotic, moral person in the world. But it doesn't matter because the first initial order is being radioed in from outside the boat is telling them, <laughs> go to the Gulf of Tonkin and blow up any speedboats that have a machine gun on it. And, and it's, it's, there's not a way for, the, for anyone then on that boat to make their own decision to say, hey, Captain, I think we should go to Africa and find some of these medicines instead. And you know, it's, it's, there's just no way of going there. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I want people to understand what really happened in the 20s with the Rockefellers wasn't an accident. This was a, uh, excuse me, this was a, um, a blatant attempt to really cut off the entire industry. Uh, E.C. Mullins wrote a book, Murder by Injection. I, I, I really highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, it's, I've, I've uh, started that book, actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, he really did. It, he shows um, what's important about. Uh, first of all, if well, you, well. Also, let me say that um, uh, Paul Cor uh, is it Paul Corbett? Not Paul Corbett. James Corbett. Right. The Corbett Report 
he has a documentary, uh, How Big Oil Conquered the World, that also does an excellent uh, job uh, for those who don't want to read a whole book um, describing this. Absolutely. Um, in fact, in that documentary, it also explains that around 1910, the way Rockefeller was able to do this was that he was infiltrating uh, local governments. He was creating local government uh, committees. Um, and, and these committees were, were basically there to bring in the wonders of modern medicine. And yeah. he, was, he was building hospitals in places under one condition. You know, we will give you this hospital, but you're going to have to utilize our equipment. You're going to have to utilize the technology that we are working on right now. So you end up creating that vessel. You now that hospital is that submarine I'm talking about, and everyone inside that submarine <laughs> is there to do good. Like they are good, good people. They have morals. They understand, but they simply don't have the equipment or the ability to even question how that hospital is going to function. And the reason why is even as on the hospital level above that, because he infiltrated all these small business organizations, you had the uh, the, the local laws were being passed in such a way to quote, quote, clean up medicine, which really what they were doing was saying, look, anything that's, I forget if it's the word allopathic, anything allopathic is good and anything the other way is bad or whichever the words are. Sorry, I can't remember. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's osteopathic. That's uh... Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Um, no, no, I mean, you're right. You said allopathic, right. But the, the other uh, type of medicine that was predominant uh, was osteopathic and naturopathic gotcha. uh, prior to that. Yeah. So there was a systematic um, takeover, and it's no different than any company. Uh, McDonald's will come into a town and lower their hamburgers in the beginning when they were starting off, off their system. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, we choke other businesses out all the time. It's a natural function of how we, how we run our economy. So it doesn't even require anyone necessarily being super evil to describe what Andrew and I are talking about. This, this is a, a simple process that can happen when you compartmentalize, because when you compartmentalize, you abandon, you end up right. abandoning your initial goal. Right, right. And also, you know, James, I mean, th this reorganization into allopathic medicine happened before all of the current, you know, group of practicing physicians were alive, right? So we didn't, we didn't witness this, uh, you know, uh, during our lifetime to see it happen, right? And, and they don't teach us about it in medical school. So, I mean... Almost none of us are aware of it. You know, I didn't become aware of this until years later uh, w when I was, you know, aware of just things in general. Uh, you know, that's when I uh, researched this. So, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is that, you know, you're so, you know, the whole way that doctors in the healthcare system is uh, portrayed, you know, in our popular culture and our media and such and uh, the way it's discussed you know, even casually by people and, uh, you know, at schools and such. So you grow up, you know, thinking, wow, this, you know, awesome. We have the best healthcare system in the world, right. right? You know, they could do miracles. This technology is fabulous, right? Of course, it's not based on any actual facts, but it, that, that's the, all the hype. That, that's all you hear. And so then you're like, oh, I want to be a part of that. Right. And, and, you know, partly there's a, there's a self-selection, right? The people that go to medical school are already primed to go through this process. Right. Um, and they make sure that they select the people like that, <laughs> you know, they know they've got a formula for it. And <clears throat> so then, then you just, they, you, you only learn what they teach you. They, they have so much information to give you. You couldn't possibly fit any more else in mm -hmm. from anywhere. Right. So you get out there and, you know, and, and all you know is that the cure for appendicitis is surgery, right? Never mind that all appendicitis is, is constipation and that you can cure it with a couple of enemas. Wow. I, I mean, I... you know, no. And, and of course, you know, my doctor friends who may end up seeing this, they're going to laugh right now to say that uh, that's so silly, but it's not, it's, that's actually, that's the truth. But, uh, you know, how much money do you make from the surgery? How much money do you make from an enema? Right. And more importantly, not more importantly, but, but just as importantly, is that it's the laugh that comes out. It's the, the, the laugh is such a telltale sign every single time. Ridicule, when, when someone brings out ridicule, it really does show you that this is a chemical thing. This is a, this is a, a serotonin, dopamine, however you wanna call it. This is a chemical thing that's causing uh, them to react this way. That they have, they've evacuated themselves 
because they're an expert. And the last thing that they can afford chemically is, is to be made a fool by following the traditions that have been done <laughs> over and over again. Of course, of course. I mean, it would jeopardize, you know, their whole existence. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but, but on the other hand, you know, James, you can't do that. So I know you're, you're absolutely right, right? It's like th these, uh, you know, doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers, they're, they're not trying to control people and keep people sick. They, and, and they don't, you know, fully know that they're doing that, right? Like, I mean, that, it's not occupying their, their entire thoughts all the time, right? So, and, and it's, you know, part of that pyramidal, arc, you know, hierarchical structure they were talking about, right? That only the people at the top really know what's going on. And, uh, and, you know, like if you, if you were in a meeting with the, the people who are running a hospital from the business point of view, you, it'd be a very different story because those people are aware. They are aware that, for example, if a patient dies in their hospital versus being, uh, you know, restored to health and released, that they stand to make uh, roughly 10 times as much money. Wait, if they die? Yeah, if they die in the hospital. The hospital makes about 10 times as much money. How's that? How does that work? Well, it, it, because uh, of all the life-saving measures that go into when someone's on the brink of death and such, oh, they have a higher yeah. level of care and uh, all, you know, any, do anything, right? Because it's like their life's on the line. So, uh, you know, wow. do anything and everything. Oh, that's creepy. And so, you know, this is a business strategy, right? And, you know, the doctors uh, taking care of the, per you know, person, they, they don't uh, see that at all. They say, oh, I'm trying to save this person. Yeah. You know, you know, and of course they are. And even, even no matter how much they realize, you know, almost every doctor is really trying to save that person. Right. The problem is they, they don't, they don't know how to save the person because they've only been taught certain things, which is mostly how to keep the person ill, but less symptomatic, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so they don't really know what would really save the person. And so they can't do it. But that being said, all of those people that do this work day to day that are generally ignorant to the you know, higher purpose of the institution, they still see every day what they're doing. They, they have to know to some degree that what they're doing is not helping. Hmm. Um, and not helping in the way that, that they were told it should help, that the way anyone, you know, what, what should you expect if you have an illness and you go, you know, to the doctor, what should, what should be the outcome? You know, if you ask people that before they go, what are they going to tell you? I'm going to be better. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you, oh, I plan to take a medicine for the rest of my life. They don't tell you, well, maybe after three surgeries, it'll be okay, you know, <laughs> yeah. right? But that's what actually happens. And so all the people doing this day in and day out, they know. I mean, every psychiatrist that sees these people, their life's a total disaster and they're miserable and they're suicidal, you give them an antidepressant, you see, they come back and they're still, says they're more suicidal. Um, nothing changes really over time. I mean, you know, they might come back and might be better and have this placebo benefit, right? But then a month later, they're back to where they were. Mm -hmm. So you, you see this just over and over and over again. You don't see, you know, there's a few times, a few illnesses here and there that something works to some degree, you know, uh, but it, it doesn't cure the whole thing. It just like there's this great medicine that if you have PTSD and you have terrible nightmares about trauma, this medicine can make your nightmares go away. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's really it's really effective. I have, I I can't argue. But but it doesn't make your PTSD go away. It doesn't heal you as a person. It right. doesn't improve your relationships. You know, um, it just relieves the nightmares. And so so. You know, if we were that modest about what we could provide and, and we're truthful about that, then, you know, people would make other choices for most things. Well, I noticed uh, I worked in a wilderness camp. It's one of my first jobs. And when we we were with the kids 24 hours a day, basically, um, it was like actually like three days on. And then I had it was like four days on, three days off. But anyway, it was, you were out in the woods with the kids the whole time. And it was a uh, trauma therapy, basically, uh, just the. The stress of being in the wilderness was causing their behaviors to come to the surface. And then, you know, you could, you could address the behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice model. Yeah. Grueling work, you know, in the sense of you're getting dirty or, you know, you're, it takes a while. There's a process that's involved. And then I woke up one day and Ritalin had stormed the campus <laughs> and it, it, it came in. First they put three kids on it. 
then there were seven kids on it. I had 13 kids in my group. And after a little bit, more than half that group was on Ritalin. And it was doing exactly what you're describing. It was creating a different state that could be noticed in a chart that, that could be written down. And that chart could then be extrapolated to be proved as, well, this is progress. Right. Even though it actually wasn't progress. It was the antithesis of that. I'm saying this now because it was the very first time that I ever even considered even thinking about questioning <laughs> uh, the, 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 the doctors on staff that were right. doing this because I was seeing that, that actually was making my job harder, that, that people were too tame. So I wasn't able to bring them to those same kind of stress where we could work on behavior, right. where they became too uh, submissive. And some people might say, well, that's fine. But then these kids were going home and then they were having like super violent outbursts. Uh, the first kid that we sent home attacked his grandmother with a lead pipe. And, and if he would have stayed in this program, I don't, I don't think that would have happened. If he yeah, it, you know, it's, it's hard to tell about these things, James, um, because, you know, like what environment did they go back into? Did mm -hmm. they go back into a dangerous environment? Right. But, but, uh, you know, I could talk about Ritalin and these kind of things all day long, but let me just say a couple of things that I think are really important. You know, one is it just it just doesn't make sense to take someone who's traumatized and has problems as a result of that trauma and give them a drug and expect that to be better. And there's got to be a healing process. There's got to they got to be removed from that trauma situation. They've got to reestablish normalcy, mm -hmm. normal development, normal relationships. You know, I don't see how a drug can make any of that happen. And, and it doesn't, of course. Uh, Ritalin specifically, anytime Ritalin, you look at any studies with any meaningful outcomes, like, I mean, the, the, the drug has been approved based on these, you know, performance tasks. Like, you know, basically you can lick more envelopes if you take right. Ritalin versus not, you know, meaningless stuff right? Not conceptual understanding, not creative thinking, you know, not anything meaningful, just rote tasks, repetitious, boring, you know, basically like what's in public school, right? You could do more public school work. Right, right. Um, but any meaningful outcomes like uh, gra improved graduation rates, uh, you know, less uh, chance of uh, being incarcerated, uh, you know, higher income level, higher employment rate. Uh, you look at any of those outcomes, none of them. There's not one but you know what? You know what? Long-term outcome is enhanced: the risk of addiction, <laughs> and and that's got to be not surprising at all, because uh, you know. And, and this is, I think, this is the bottom line with giving drugs like that. Okay, do you want to go, you know, out to the country and buy some crystal meth, and give that to your child before school every day? Because that's exactly what you're doing. Except, you know, you're doing it from a white coat in a pharmacy and, it, and you know, a, instead of going to a trailer out in the country. But really, what's the difference? It's the same exact thing. How, how can you, you know, tell me it's any different? And so, so if the parents bring their child and even and most of these parents, you know, are or many of these parents, maybe they didn't do right by the child. And that's why the child has the problem. But even so, if I told them that you know, okay, would, would you like me to, to uh, direct you to the nearest meth dealer um, to treat your kid? What would they say? Right. But that's, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. You know, it's, and, it's so hard for people to see the truth of it. And anyone who is to ask questions, especially a 22 year old like me to come in and actually say stuff like that. I didn't, I wasn't armed at the time to even know that chemical imbalance is a myth. That we've been told that there's, please correct me if I'm wrong here, Andy, but we've been told that there's a chemical imbalance <laughs> in the brain, but I'm not aware that we've actually found what chemical it is. I'll, I'll tell you that the yeah. only chemical imbalance that occurs is actually created by the drugs. Um, and that's why you have withdrawal uh, from them uh, because it throws off your chemistry. But no, there's, there's no evidence whatsoever to support any chemical lesion uh, or any abnormality in the physical chemistry right. of the brain. Now, and, and also, you shouldn't even think about it that way. Like, I know you, you talk about chemical mind control, but the chemical stuff is not the cause. It's not the primary condition. It just, it's like a representative state. Mm 
It's like the medium that the communication goes through, like cells communicate to each other through these chemical signals, right? But, but the chemical signal is not the origin of the information. It's just transducing the information, right? So what is the origin of the information? Well, you know, it's an, it's an interaction of the primordial part of us and the environment in some way, right? And you can look at this at different levels. If I were to stick strictly with sort of a, you know, material science, then you just say it's, you know, the DNA expression, including the epigenetic expression. And that responds to the environment and directs all of the physiology where to go. And then it's communicated via these chemical signals. Mm -hmm. Um, But the, and the chemical signals can become, you know, perpetuated and um, uh, conditioned. Right. And so you can get that conditioned response that's mediated through the chemistry. Right. But, but the chemistry is just basically sending the signal. So you get that dopamine hit, right? The dopamine is not the origin of it. Right. It's just, uh, it's, it's just the, the expression. Right. You know, so how, how many professionals in the medical industry, I realize this is not a scientific question. How many people would you say are walking around thinking that chemical imbalance is legit? Well, it's much easier to just say it is. I mean, if you're a psychiatrist or if you're a primary care, you know, most antidepressants, for example, they're prescribed by primary care doctors. Mm -hmm. And primary care doctors have just about zero training, by the way, in in treating mental illness. Um, In their residency, they have no no requirement at all. Um, They do one to two months in their third year of medical school. Uh, But that could be almost anything. So it may not be relevant to, you know, just working with regular people who are depressed or anxious or whatever, um, or, you know, kids with behavior problems. Uh, But so, you know, I think a lot of them really think it's true. Yeah. You know, even in psychiatry. So when I was in my training at Duke, they had this big study came out um, and it was like a data mining study. If you remember the big data uh, craze that was going on uh, at that time, right? Because you were in, in, uh, in computers, so mm-hmm. probably relevant to your field. And so they did this huge study and they, uh, in, in older people in like nursing homes and assisted living facilities, and they saw the signal that there was uh, some gene that metabolized the serotonin, I think, um, that it, they, they thought it was abnormal. And they actually jumped the gun and they had like a national press conference and they said, Oh, this is, this is what the cause of depression is or whatever. And, and I remember, you know, everyone was so proud at Duke and the psychiatry department, especially they made a big announcement and like had like a reception that morning or whatever, you know, and like, and then a couple of weeks later, it's like, Oh, nobody's talking about that anymore. <laughs> and it turns out it was, you know, it's just a statistical anomaly. Right. It was complete BS. And um, the whole reason this found out, you know, the first antidepressant drugs were antihistamines. They were, de- they were trying to develop allergy drug, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I th- actually, maybe it was, it was Thorazine I'm thinking of. But, but basically, you know, they, they noticed this drug had some behavioral effects and then they tried it. And then they, then they saw maybe it quieted some people with illness. And then they looked, what does it do? And they found, oh, in a laboratory, it, it blocks this receptor of this chemical. And they said, oh, well, then this chemical must be the cause of this illness. And that's it. That's the dopamine hypothesis was the first one in schizophrenia and then the serotonin hypothesis later on in depression. But yeah, it's, it's all, you know, it, it's meaningless. It makes those little commercials, you know, where they have the, the little dots representing the neurotransmitter or something. But, uh, but no, there's no... There's no real science behind that at all. In fact, uh, you know, I mean, if we were talking about something like depression, and that's not really what, what we were going to talk about today, but I, I wouldn't even say it's an illness. It's more like uh, analogous to a fever, that it can represent many, many different things that are wrong, um, and, uh, and it's like a symptom that tells you something's wrong and you've got to figure it out. And it, and it could be purely psychological, and it could be purely physical, and it could be everywhere in between and many, many different things. Right. That's, that's fascinating. That, that, that is a great topic that you might have to have to dive into later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we can always have another, (laughs) another session, but, uh, but James, I really, uh, you know, I want to stress how dangerous, uh, the healthcare system is, um, because it's actually, you know, I think probably if you see the, one of the things is that, that they don't actually do the research, uh, the best way to show some of these things, because I, I think they don't want to show how dangerous certain things are. 
Um, but I think if you, if you really had good quality um, epidemiologic numbers, I think you'd probably show that, that the healthcare system was the leading cause of death in our country. Um, it, you, you can definitely show that it's the third leading cause of death um, because th that's what they say at Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School. And uh, that's one of the most prestigious medical schools in the country. So if you don't believe them, you know, then who are you going to believe about anything? Uh, but they did this study uh, a few years ago um, where they, they wanted to look at this because there were some previous studies like from the Institutes of Medicine that showed it was pretty significant. But, um, but they weren't sure if it was accurate. They wanted to do it a different way to see what the numbers. Um, and so they did a pretty thorough methodology. But they... They were not looking at all deaths from medical care. They were only looking at what they call medical errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is when a mistake was made and the care was not delivered according to the standard of care correctly. Okay, so, you know, like a common understanding of this might just be, you know, doing surgery on the wrong side of the body, giving the wrong dose of a medication, you know, by accident, simple things like that. Okay, it could be misdiagnosis and treating the wrong illness. Uh, but there's always a mistake. So it's not the way healthcare is supposed to be carried out. There are additional deaths that I'll get to in a minute from when healthcare is followed to the standard of care. They're not included in this number. So the third leading cause of death, okay, and this is a, the CDC's numbers. So the cancer and heart disease are the top two. I think heart disease and cancer is number two, according to the CDC, and they have respiratory disease as number three. But the number of deaths from medical errors is much higher than respiratory disease. So it easily gets the number third category. But even though this study came out several years ago uh, and was widely accepted, reported in the mainstream media all over the place and been repeated in Canada, shown the same result, um, they still don't, on the CDC website, they don't list this as a cause of death at all, <laughs> right? Because well, don't want people to know, but we're talking about 150,000 deaths a year. Yeah. The, the, From medical errors. Okay. So this is just the tip of the iceberg, like I said, right? These are only the deaths from the errors. Now, it's really hard to add up all of the deaths that are not from errors um, because they're not systematically reported. In some places, actually, the way it's not reported clearly at all. And I'm going to highlight a very important example of that. But, but just to mention a few of these things. So like Tylenol, okay? Mm -hmm. Very, very common medication, over-the-counter. You give it to babies, everybody feels it's safe, right? People, some people know that it can actually cause liver failure in an overdose, but uh, usually you have to take quite a bit of that. And I've seen, in, as a psychiatrist, I've seen several cases of that. But actually, some people can just be sensitive to the liver toxicity and just die at a normal dose. And, and you can find studies that show about 400 people a year die this way. So they're not trying to kill themselves. They're just taking Tylenol as directed. And 400 people die doing that a year just from Tylenol. Okay. So I'm only mentioning one drug and already we're at 400 people. Um, talk about antipsychotics um, because that, that's in my, in my field. Um, so there's this very large study that came out of Tennessee looking at something like 17,000 uh, uh, children and adolescents who are prescribed antipsychotics. And uh, most of these are given for the same reason they give Ritalin, so for behavior problems. Okay, but these drugs are really for schizophrenia. They're very powerful drugs. They do work to a degree uh, for some people. They can be pretty effective. You've talked to Jerry Barzinski about them, right? Um, but they find that basically people are just dropping dead. Kids and adolescents just spontaneously die, no reason, no warning. And then if you look f further, these studies in the intended population of people with schizophrenia, now the newer drugs that came out in the 80s and 90s have been around long enough that we have some longer term data. And you see that, that people are dying pretty young in their 40s and 50s, mostly of you know, cardiovascular type disease, that same stuff we talked about earlier. Those are very toxic. A lot of people die. Sleeping pills. Um, this large study out of Pennsylvania, um, there, I forget, uh, there's a big health care system there where they all share their medical records so they can do big studies out of it. Once again, look at 30 or 40,000 people over a five-year period. Mm -hmm. And people taking as little as 14 doses in a calendar year of a sedating sleeping pill were more likely to die at five years out, increased mortality. Wow. Yeah. 
and you know how common sleeping pills are in yeah. this country. They're, they're in the top 10 uh, prescribed medications. And we're talking about any, any of the ones that are sedating. So like the ones that are sleeping pills like Ambien and Restoril, um, but also psych drugs like Trazodone that are antihistamines, Benadryl. Those were all included in this study and antipsychotics like Seroquel. So, and they all have this effect. And there were two other studies in Europe that basically showed the same thing with these drugs. Wow. So this is not an isolated, these aren't, you know, I'm not trying to not to mention something that's just a small study here or there. I'm trying to show big, meaningful studies. Um, uh, proton pump inhibitors, great example. This is a drug I took for like 20 years. And I'm talking about like Prilosec, the purple pill, uh, drugs for heartburn and reflux. Okay, you know, they were touted as, uh, you know, the cure for ulcers and people didn't have to suffer from ulcers anymore. And um, they also said, this is, this is what they really sold us when these drugs came out in the 90s and were uh, really encouraging to be used, that they'll prevent esophageal cancer. Because the, the theory goes is that if you have acid coming up, refluxing in your esophagus all the time, that the exposure of those cells to the acid causes this thing called Barrett's esophagus. And then that turns into cancer over time. Right. And now that, that people have been taking these drugs and they've been looking at the data, actually what they find out is actually it's the drug that's causing esophageal cancer and people taking this drug are getting it at much higher rates. Thank God I got off of it. Uh, but it was really, really nasty and difficult to get off that drug. Um, really, really tough. If you Google it, you'll find lots of uh, horror stories. Um, although I, I know, I know how to do it now, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, um, let's talk about, uh, drugs and suicide. So antidepressants, um, you know, this, uh, black box warning came out several years ago. I was at Duke at my residency when it came out and, you know, they were kind of like, basically their message was you have to pay this lip service because it's a black box warning, but really we think it's bogus. You know, <laughs> you know, that these, it, and what it said is that it increased these uh, suicidal behavior, kind of vague. But if you look further at the data, you see that the drugs increase, we're talking about antidepressants, they increase suicidal thoughts, which increases suicidal behavior, which increases suicides. And there, there's actually had to do separate studies to connect those dots because the FDA and the drug company surveillance, they wouldn't actually provide the direct data to suicide. They put this, you know, other uh, less serious sounding thing in there to make you less worried about it. But if you go then and do research yourself and then look, do the studies that correlate the behavior that they say, the FDA says, to actual suicide, and yes, they do correlate to actual suicide, right? And then since I've been aware of this, I've seen people, like I've taken lots of teenagers off antidepressants, and they tell me, gosh, you know, my suicidal thoughts stopped coming after you got me off that drug. And, and, you know, it's like, even now, it's hard to even understand how does a drug create someone to have thoughts, you know? But when you see this time and again, uh, and then pair it with all these studies, you know, it, it's real. Obviously, it's real. Um, there's other drugs that, by the way, have shown increased suicide and some specifically some antibiotics, uh, like quinolones. And that, that data has been sort of covered up too. Because, uh, like they said, that it was due to the infection, not due to the antibiotics. Um, you know, things like that. But if you look closely, you can see that, that that's not the case. So, the, so the, the big example that I want to bring up that, that you can see that the way the research has been done really kind of tries to hide this number is with diabetes drugs. And, um, you know, so most people know of insulin, which is usually used for people who have the the childhood type of diabetes, type one diabetes, which is about 15, 10 to 15% of all cases of diabetes. So it's much, much less common than the other kind, which is purely related to your diet and, and highly related to obesity, but not, not in everyone. Um, and you know, most people that get it as adults, they, they all have the type two. Um, so they, they take insulin sometimes too, when it gets more severe, but usually they just take pills. But many of these pills, I mean, almost all of them with a few exceptions, can make your sugar go too low. And so there are all these guidelines they have around, you know, how low do you keep the blood sugar to keep it well controlled without going too low, right? Um, and so there's been a lot of controversy over the years, but the, there's always been this pull to tighter and tighter control. And you can see that the diabetes establishment 
wants to show that tighter control has better long-term outcomes. Um, and when people go to like a diabetes center, right, where there are these all over the country, a lot of them are Jocelyn diabetes centers, but there are others too. They always like favor tight control at those places. And when you get the tight control, then you risk the blood sugar going too low, right? And when the blood sugar goes too low, you die, right? Or actually you can be, you can be saved because you can recognize it. You can be saved in time, but if you do, there's still health consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I found, I found pretty clear data on that data on that. So for example, there was this one uh, nice study that showed that people who had one or more episodes of hypoglycemia, right, that they didn't die from, actually had a 5% chance of dying from hypoglycemia. So that's one in 20 people just treated for diabetes could die from their, from their treatment directly. And, and you know, like they, uh, they have some guidelines that if, that where the guideline is set, actually a lot of people that that guideline would be taking those drugs actually have an increased risk of death and uh, compared to if they had no treatment at all. Um, so, so how do you find this? It's almost impossible to find an actual number. How many people each year die of, uh, you know, low blood sugar from diabetes drugs. You just can't find this. And they have, there's lots of data for people dying, dying of drug overdoses. Um, you know, like even the 400 Tylenol deaths, right? That you could find. Um, and that's only 400 people. There's many, many more people who are affected by this hypoglycemic issue. If you go around and ask, you know, an ambulance driver, they'll say, oh yeah, I get every shift. Um, in fact, there was one study I found that is between one and two of every emergency department visit in the entire country is for hypoglycemia from taking too much of a diabetes medicine. Wow. Yeah. It was 1.4 to 1.8% of all ER visits. So this is huge, <laughs> yep. but you can't find this number anywhere. You can, you can know exactly how many people died of heroin overdose, but you can't, they hide this number. And you can see, if you look at the articles, this all this debate um, about, oh, you know, somebody says they're dangerous and occasionally might even mention that it should be taken off the market. But then other people say, oh, that's nonsense. I've been using these for years. It's safe, you know? And, and this is what, this is one of the ways that it quells any, any time you start to question things, you'll see that the establishment goes just, just a little bit far enough to say, we know there's problems and we're working on it. Mm -hmm. We're we're doing something, but they never actually do anything. Like, uh, like here's a great example. There was this um, slideshow. So like Medscape and some other organizations, they basically just uh, are like clearing houses of all this data and um, medical data and news and guidelines and such. And I don't know how much of it comes from industry, but some of it does. And they, they send you, if you sign up, you know, they send you an email, several emails, you know, a week or whatever. And a lot of it is education, you know, like they're trying to let you know about the latest trends or maybe get you to sign up for a CME. And so they send this slideshow and it's like, people can't even read an actual article. So, so they have this thing, you know, it's just like a slide and a, and a caption so you can get through it in five minutes. Right. And it was, it was really useful because it was basically it said these drugs should be deprescribed. It was the title. Right. Right. And, and so you're like, wow, I can't believe they're admitting that these drugs, you know, are no good, but then you go in and, and you know, you read it and, and you see that it doesn't quite say that. Right. Like it says, it says this drug, either this drug doesn't work at all. Like it said that for DocuSafe, that, uh, you know, um, pill that's uh, a stool softener, Colace, um, that red pill that they always give to everybody and it doesn't do anything. So they said it's been studied. It doesn't actually do anything. (laughs) And but at the end, they don't say it should be taken off the market. They just say you might want to reconsider. (laughs) Right, right. You know, so it's like it shows you, oh, they're doing something. They're letting us choose. They're giving us the information. It's like we're going to be safe. Anything that's really bad, they're not going to let it hang around for too long. Right. You can see this is evidence. They're doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but they never actually take the right step. Yeah. You know, they don't pull it. You know, I mean, the only time they pull stuff off the market is when the lawsuits come and it gets, starts to get expensive and they see that it's not sustainable. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, sustainable is the right word in that case. For right. Sure. Because you know they they have lawsuits all the time and it costs them nothing. Even right. if they even if they pay you know five hundred million dollars, uh, you know well, the drug makes you know a billion dollars a year, mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. they can afford it, right? Well, even if a jury comes back with a guilty verdict, there's still a lot of cases where the judge will still step in. And Absolutely. Say, hey, Actos, I know you made sixteen billion off this drug, and I know that you've just been. Uh, lost a settlement for nine billion, so basically half of half of what you made off this drug, but that's too much. So we'd rather you just pay thirty five million, for example. I mean, that's like an actual case. So it, this, it, it's this basically just it's just bribery. Yeah, it's like retroactive bribery. And, and and it's would you agree that I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here, but would you agree that if we had fifty FDAs instead of one FDA? In other words, if we had more of a decentralized way of, of looking at this stuff and treating this stuff, that it would be that much harder for, for it to be this easy to get away with basically a clinical murder, really. Well, if we had 50 FDAs, we just have 50 times as many toxic drugs. But if, but if, if, we, had, if we had a true, you know, peer decentralized way of evaluating things. Yeah, of course. I mean, and we, you, you don't even, you don't need to put, uh, you know, power and authority into people to approve or not approve. This, this could be done on a, you know, on a sort of casual consensus basis that you just have a, a way, to, uh, a place to put the information and then people experience the, the treatment and, and if it doesn't go well, they put the information on this database and then you quickly see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and then you can know, oh, I'm going to stay away from that stuff. But it you know, puts a responsibility on you that you have to go and look at the database before you decide if you're going to try that treatment. Right, right. You know? And it, it's uh, <clears throat> when you have... But, but also, James, I, w- I would say, I, I think it's the wrong way to go to try to make new molecules as drugs, as treatments. I would just abandon that altogether. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the safety of natural substances already existing in the world is pretty much known. Right. So really it simplifies things. It just put, throws out this whole issue. Cause I haven't seen any advances with technology that are superior to any natural methods Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe there might be some like, uh, you know, if you have severe trauma and, and this is, you know, another area, like m- even when I suggest to people like to go without health insurance or not go to the doctor, you know, they say, well, what if I'm in a car accident? Mm-hmm. And I would say in almost every case, you still don't need, you, you can take care of your injuries just as well at home in almost every case. But there, there are some cases, you know, like if, you, if your bone is sticking out of your skin, <laughs> you know, that'd be hard to take care of at home, you know? And so it would be good to go to somebody who can do that, you know, in that situation, right? So, so there's some things, some discrete technologies and, and discrete situations where it could be really awesome and it could be really useful, right? And I would just limit it to those situations and I don't think, you know, these, you know, it's, it's really dangerous to make a molecule and try to put it into people's bodies. Mm-hmm. You know, all of the, um, the natural molecules that, you know, they were all kind of uh, had a chance to be exposed, right, in the environment. You know, it's like there's this wisdom that in our bodies has it knows how to deal with all of these things. I mean, some of them may kill us, right? And we have to know which ones those are <laughs> to avoid them. But all the ones we know, you know, it's like we could put them in our body and our body knows how to handle them. It's not going to, you know, and the ones that our body doesn't know, we know, you know, we know what they are so we can avoid them or use them very carefully and expecting things are not going to be perfect if we're desperate. Yeah. But if we're making brand new chemicals, who the hell knows? Yeah. And, and it's not just like we can test it in the short term and know, like, what if it changes us slowly, you know, and there's lots of examples like that, things that, you know, like those, the, the medicine are the proton pump inhibitors I was mentioning before, that doesn't cause esophageal cancer overnight, it takes years, right, 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 and so you need to test it for years to know. And so I think, I think that approach is, is really doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Well, we've had that. Um, I'm reminded of Mercury, and I'm surprised at how many people try and dismiss this when, when I'm telling people the history of our medicine. I'm having to remind them that for 100 years, if not more, we were committed to the idea that I have to find some way of getting this mercury inside of you and you will be okay. It, like for a hundred years, we did that. It, we developed paste out of it. We developed uh, liquid drinks out of it, food, whatever we could do. Sometimes you would actually cut the arm open and stick pasted mercury inside someone's skin. And we were convinced for about a hundred years that this is the way to do it. And it, it's part of this slow toxicity that you're never able to, to prevent. But right. when I try and explain to people, hey, look, if that happened then, why are you so sure <laughs> that we have everything worked out now? Well, that, that's our, our modern day fluoride. Yeah. I mean, people still think that's a great idea for the most part. You know, even the CDC put out a, uh, a warning uh, back in the early 2000s saying don't use fluoridated water for baby formula because it's a neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, what about the rest of us? Um, you know, so that's, that's already doing that to us right now. It's serving in that role, just one of the many things. And I think, you know, maybe this is the segue into vaccines. Yeah. The, uh, um, before we go there, the, the uh, aluminum is another really good example of that. We're, we're now telling everyone that aluminum is fine, that you can put aluminum in the body and there's nothing. Who's saying that? Well, the CDC <laughs> is. The CDC will, will literally tell you. I, I'm not making this up. Were you talking about in, because of the aluminum in vaccines? They're saying that, or they're yeah, saying in yeah, general? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and, in vaccines, and, right? And also, but but they they explain it this way. Oh well, because aluminum is so abundant in the atmosphere, you should be fine to stick it inside inside your skin. And, and then they try and equate that that swallowing something is the same as injecting it in your body. Right. And, and I know you know this, Andy, but guys, those are not the same thing. And the fact that we have the CDC that's putting out brochures and, and pictures and flyers telling you, hey, if you can eat aluminum, you can inject it in your skin. That should tell you something. That should yeah. tell you something very clear about the, about the lack of understanding of this. Wow. I, you know, aluminum is one of the, the most dangerous things and it's actually causing a lot of illness in our country. I yeah. mean, I think a lot of the dementia is uh, directly attributable to aluminum. Actually, well, let's, uh, I'm going to, uh, just to make sure that the recording's good. I'm going to, I'm going to break this here right now, Andy. Okay. We're going to go into vaccines for sure, because this is what we, we wanted to get to, but, but I'm really glad that we got this, all this build up. Um, here to do that. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, guys, if you're seeing this, you're probably going to see this on YouTube. And if you just look down in the description, you'll see that, you know, part two, uh, we'll probably actually call it vaccines because actually I want to let, I'm just going to see what Andy talks about. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we'll, we'll label it there. But I just want you guys to know that we're, we're just taking a break here because a lot of people, they like the video to be a certain size. So um, before we do that, uh, Andy, thank you so much for, for giving us your time. And, and also, you're really sticking your neck out here, I think, too, in a lot of ways. So uh, thank you for, for showing that bravery. I, I wish there were more more out there like you. Well, uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, material, you know, these things, uh, some things just have to be said. And, um, you know, I, I need to be honest with myself. I need to, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, some other people can benefit or maybe they'll uh, decide to uh, do some of their own research and uh, maybe contribute, you know, more to this, uh, to this method. But, you know, I want to, I want people to realize that um, they can actually uh, be healthy uh, through their own efforts and um, they don't need to rely on the system. So it's very scary that, you know, I'm telling you the truth that the system is not there to help you and actually could, could even kill you. And that's a product, actually probably a pretty good chance of that. But but I'm telling you, I want to also tell you that, you know, you don't have to rely on it and that you can actually be quite, quite healthy and quite happy and take care of most things, uh, almost everything without relying on this system at all. So, you know, maybe we'll be able to get there, uh, you know, after we uh, discuss some, <laughs> some more dark topics. But, um, but that, that's absolute truth. So, so, you know, don't let this, just like all of this dark information, you know, don't let this bring you down because really it's really actually liberating because yeah. you can now see what actually you can really do to make yourself healthy. And, uh, once you do that, you, you realize you'll be feeling great and you won't be stuck. Uh, you won't have to, 
you know, take pills all the time and, uh, you know, feel sluggish and uh, all these things, uh, because all, all these things could be mostly just simply remedied. And, and you know, you can get into a, a situation where you're just feeling great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, where can can people find you in a certain way? Can, can you can you? Uh... Actually, I, I'm quite hidden <laughs> right now. Okay. Uh, you, you know, you can definitely uh, find me on on Facebook, of course. Um, I I have a, a website, but I I've not uh, set it up yet. Um, so uh, maybe you could uh, you know put my email um, in the comments, or I'll put my email in the comments so that if anyone actually wants to get in touch with me. Uh, but I, I am planning to start putting out more material, um, so I'll be having a YouTube channel, and um, uh, I'll get the website running up at some point. Fantastic! I I I, I love this. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> this is. Uh, um, we're gonna we're gonna sign this off right now, but again, we'll we'll, we'll be right back. So uh, so so thank you very much, Doctor uh, Andy Kaufman. Thank you for your time <laughs> for being here today, and uh, we're gonna pick this up in just a little bit. All right, great to be with you, James.